So, Katam, I've been very excited to get you onto the show. Firstly, because I think, you know, your courses really have had a big impact on the way I look at my career, both on and off the gym floor and both your in-person online courses. Um, but for people who may not know you or may not know a little bit of your backstory, it almost appears that you've become, you've appeared on the scene overnight with this really strong brand that people know well. But as we both know, there's no such thing as an overnight success. And I know there was 20 years behind you. So tell us a little bit about like, who you are, who you became, like, who you are. Well, so right, what I am right now, basically, is an educator, mostly for trainers. And, you know, we'll say the, the more thoughtful of those of the fitness industry, the people that care about the nuances, so to speak. Um, but I think a big reason why, you know, it seems like I've come onto the scenes late is just that in the majority of my career, I prefer to be behind the scenes. Right. So when I was working with IFBB pros, when I was with Olympians, Olympic athletes, whatever, I was, we'll put it this way. Like I tried to be as humble as possible during those years of my life. And I really tried to make everything about the athletes that I was working with. Um, and I also got into the role of what we'll say is kind of a fixer, meaning that through my, you know, through the years of education, you know, I was a big fan with Charles Poliquin, which, you know, you're very familiar with whatever. And Charles and uh, Bob Rakowski both turned me down like the functional medicine route. And that basically just started me like getting in the weeds and taking every outside of university education thing that I could have, like, like for a while, I was probably traveling at least one weekend a month for a two year period, you know, to take course. I, th I tallied it somewhere at about 160 K that I spent over the course of those two years, right? Like U S dollars on continued education, because once I got the taste for it, I just, I just wanted it as fast as I could. But while I was going through that process, I didn't feel like I should be, you know, very vocal and obviously social media wasn't what it was. Um, but I think once I stepped out of that light, I had enough support from all of the people that I had worked with. I had enough clout in kind of like some of the who's who's of people, even if, you know, they aren't super public about it, that it allowed us to quickly transition to being a success on our own, if that mm. makes sense. Right. So the transition from basically, I think in, prior to like 2017, I didn't really use social media like for business at all. Like it was like the rare odd, you know, thing or whatever. Right. So we're definitely behind on that, but coming on after that, you know, especially like, cause I know the, you know, the prime time to grow was like, you know, 2015 to 2017. And we somehow I managed to just perfectly land on the, the backside slope of that. Like, like right when Facebook decided, Hey, we're no longer going to share any of your stuff with anybody unless you pay us. Like that's when we decided to start, <laughs> you know, working on that stuff. Um, but I think, you know, the things that really propelled us were, you know, having put all of that work in with a lot of really important, really credible people uh, in the industry. And then having that foundation where once I did decide to come out and start speaking, um, it wasn't like, oh, hey, here's this guy that's just starting in the industry. I was able to talk like I'd been in the industry forever because I had been in the industry forever. Um, I just, you know, I mean, to me, to me personally, I still wish my role was behind the scenes like like the the I, I love getting in you know I love getting in front of students and teaching them um but in terms of you know being on social media and the marketing aspects those are definitely my least favorite aspects of the business necessary but least favorite yeah I mean do you do you feel at all like it was it was mentally daunting at first coming from being like in gyms like in my 40 being the, the head of education but being within a big brand like I, I mean, I'm coming at the industry in a slightly different angle to you these days and maybe help training, going directly for coaches helps. But I was very similar in running education for a global brand there. The brand was what, what was known. I wasn't what was known. And then coming out to that it was almost a little bit, I wouldn't say imposter syndrome because I knew my worth, but it was it was a very daunting thing. It was like now no one knows who I am. I've got to almost prove a point. I mean, was this similar for you or did you have enough connection and goodwill built up that it was quite seamless? Um, I would say it was quite seamless, partly because of the connections and also because, you know, MI40 was a bit of a farce. I mean, if you, if you know the history of when theirs is like the, we'll say the, the brand and what was going on there didn't live up to the expectations. And so basically anybody that, anybody that knew enough, which basically was everybody that had invested money in there knew who the real brains and who the thought, you know, leaders were in there and who the people doing the actual work were. So when we stepped out, basically all of those people 
followed us, right? Yeah. And that was basically all of the people that were highly invested. So to the like the casual person that just followed, you know, those those people on social media, they might not have known the real story. And so they might not have like realized who we were, or how much of the work that we we're doing, but pretty much everybody that had invested knew. So we were able to build our credibility within that because if you, you know, if you came to a camp during the, the MI40 days, like I led that camp, I, you know, I taught that camp, you know, so that, that authority was already there. Like the online coaching and stuff that we did and a lot of the programs and whatever, like a lot of that was, you know, was my work and some of it was Cody's work and stuff. So when we, when we moved on, it was very easy for those people to be like, okay, I see where the, I see where the minds are going. And so I'm going to follow, follow them. Right. And I mean, okay. if you followed that, like one thing has stayed the same and some things have changed a lot over the course of those, you know, four years. Yeah, you see, I think you see it. You see it. It's very common. You tend to see trends. And I think I, see, I often see trends in these big fitness brands where a lot of them have a boom period when they have a number of guys in the right place at the right time. And and as businesses grow and scale, it almost becomes that they, if you ever heard the E myth, the E myth sums mm-hmm. this up powerfully for me in that it's like, right, we'll create a system of working and then we'll teach somebody brand new to do that system and then it all often gets watered down and that's when you start seeing like another other brands coming with you know the the level of integrity that you know n1 has and various other people coming out of the muscle mentors and from other gyms and things like that so like going into like learning to be an expert one of the things i was really fascinated about getting you on was while i was talking about training was that you, you your level of knowledge is, is, is outstanding i think no one can question that like what are your sort of like professional development tips? How have you become the expert that you are today in terms of training, nutrition, and everything else? Well, let me start by saying, I don't think you can learn to become an expert. I think hmm. what you do is you just never stop learning. And then eventually, if you grind at that, if you grind away at that enough, maybe then your peers will start to view you yeah. as an expert. But you can't just be like, I want to be an expert. What are the things that I have to do? Because to be a real expert, you have to understand that the target will always be moving, right? Like these, to be an expert means that you have to be following the innovations of the field. So it's a never ending pursuit, right? Like you might, like from a business perspective, you might be able to reach a certain level where it's just like, okay, at a, a particular moment in time, I could maybe be considered an expert or really knowledgeable on a specific thing. But if you haven't got there with the habit of this is just going to be an ongoing thing, that's when you quickly create your own glass ceiling. And I see that happen to people all of the time where they think, okay, I just need to get to where X, Y, Z person is, but that person is, you know, six years, 10 years, you know, 20 years ahead of you. Um, And then by the time they get there, that's no longer the place to be like, that's like, that's no longer what an expert is. And so I don't think that you can decide like, Hey, you know, uh, I just want to, you know, accomplish X, Y, Z things. Like I want to get a degree or whatever. Um, I think the thing that has really helped me is just my obsession with wanting to continue to learn even, even at this stage in my career. And the thing is, it becomes more and more challenging because eventually you run out of classes to take, you run out of courses to take, um, you know, you start looking at the research and be like, okay, like, is anybody going to do like how many interesting papers are going to come out this year after you've read so many of the papers, especially how many papers are going to come out that are actually going to change or add something instead of just, you know, kind of reaffirming what we're already doing, et cetera. Um, and so you just have to continually scale your efforts to get better, the better you get, right? I mean, it's like, it's like any skill as, as you would move, as you would move up in levels of sport, right? You know, if you, you know, you start at, you know, in grade school and you're just playing with, you know, the, the people that are close to you, right? That, you know, but then if you exceed on to university or whatever, now you're, now you're playing with people that were successful in their local regions. And then to be a pro, now you're playing with the top of those. And then if you want to be like, you know, a hall of fame, all timer or whatnot, it's just like, all right, it takes a lot more work because at that point in time, the playing field is now higher. You have to do different things to, you know, separate yourself or, you know, get better. And, you know, if you're competing with yourself, you're basically always chasing your own heels, right? Like, so, like, so it's just like, how do I, how do I beat the guy 
from yesterday, right? And if I do beat that guy, that means the guy I have to the, the guy that I have to go against to tomorrow is going to be an even harder challenge to beat. I, I, I always think exactly the same thing. It's with often the, the top the buzzword topic these days in terms of productivity and things like that is is imposter syndrome. How do you overcome imposter syndrome? And I got asked this on a podcast myself the other day, and I was like. I don't consider imposter syndrome necessarily a bad thing. If you let it paralyze you, it is. But it's it's my imposter syndrome that's kept me pushing for more. But that and my obsession. So like, I'm not satisfied where I am. I'm going to push to learn for more. And like you said, it's like when I first started, when I first walked into the doors at, at UP, it was the, the people around me that were my, the people I looked up to. And then it's like, you know, when I was in Virgin Active, it was the person who did the most sessions. And now coming out into the, the big wide world with social media, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, I can look and compare myself to people like you, yourself and then one Jordan Shallow. And you know, these, they're just the names get bigger and the, the ceiling just gets higher. And I just have to keep sort of like trying to rise. And like, as you said, if I, if I compared myself to someone like you, you've got just, a, just under a decade on me, probably maybe more in the industry. So it's just a case of as long as I'm keeping my head down, keeping focus, these things will come up. So with your education, either past or present, I mean, like, you mentioned obviously going to courses very frequently, but how much of your day is spent around improving your education? Because I think there's a there's a lot of coaches out there now who want to be educators. And I, I work with a lot of coaches, a mentor, a lot of coaches, and often they underestimate the amount of time and effort in the back end that goes into learning your craft. For me, I always looked at studying as an investment for me in five years, and I prioritize that as much as anything else. Like how much of your day is based around becoming a better cast? Um, well, every minute that I can afford, technically, I mean, if, if you were to follow me around, like if I were to do a day in a life video, um, you would see that I am, we'll, we'll say, call it on like the majority of the time. And it's, you know, the hard part is, is shutting it off. And that means that, you know, if I'm walking the dog, I'm trying to find something to listen to, right. You know, or if I'm driving the car, like basically that I try not to have any dead space, in my mind, mm -hmm. especially like as soon as I get a bug, as soon as I get a train of thought that I want to go and investigate, like I will, I will, I will throw the work that I'm supposed to be doing on the wayside and hunt down, you know, some research or something like that, or, or look at, or I'll be like, okay, uh, I know we were supposed to do a this and this, but I want to change. And I want to run these protocols in the lab this week, because I, like, I want to know, and I want to know now, um, which is awesome that we have that ability to do that sometimes now, which is like, Hey, I want to see if we do this, if it seems to stimulate that muscle better than this other thing. Right. Just, you know, you know, the, the number of times where I'm in the shower and I'm like, you know what? if we added this amount of rotation here, would that make it easier to get it in the right position for this exercise? And then, you know, like a few fumbles around in the lab later, we can either confirm or, you know, deny that, which is kind of cool um, versus like just waiting to see, okay, hopefully somebody does a paper on this at some point in time. Mm -hmm. um, but the challenge is, is that the, we'll say the more I do that, there is that whole like burning, you know, the candle at both ends, if you will, right? And so I will, I will go through like, okay, I, I will be like that. And then all of a sudden I will hit a wall and be like, okay, now I need two days of just like absolutely nothing to recharge. Right. So, and then I'll, you know, I'll shut all the stuff. I'll go up in the mountains or, or whatever it is, you know, recharge. And then as I come back, I always find that my productivity then elevates. So as much as I, you know, try to say like, yeah, I try to work hard, but I also understand that just working hard is not necessarily working smart. So I have to recognize when my productivity starts to starts to come down. Mm -hmm. So everybody, you have, you have to find that dose for yourself of like, what is a reasonable amount for me to do in a week, to do in a day, you know, to do in a month or whatever before I need to. And for some people, it's not a, it's not a sprint or blast and cruise like I do where it's like, okay, today I'm like, I don't care if I work till nine o'clock at night and I'm still going through this stuff. And then in bed, when I'm trying to sleep, I probably spend at least three of three of those hours, like running these thoughts in my head, et cetera, like it's all focused on that. And then, you know, then it does take a lot of time to recover, but for other people it might be like, no, you know, I'm going to spend like the first 30 minutes of my day. That's when I'm going to read or, or whatever it may be. Right. I think the most important thing is, is that you just do it constantly hmm. as you do. You just make it as like, uh, I'm not going to take this course and then just stop. You should be like, 
I'm going to take this course, right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to audit that information and I'm going to decide what things I want to research further. I'm going to make a plan for how I'm going to audit that because every course you go to is going to have some good stuff, some bad stuff, some things that just simply may not apply to you or your clientele or whatever. Um, and other things where it's like, this doesn't apply right now, but I know it's going to be important. So I want to make sure I put in the notes and do the work now so that I have, I have that information later when that client that needs it comes along or et cetera, or when I change to that phase of my career, right? Like for instance, you know, you'll get, we'll get people that either only train in person or only train online. And we'll kind of cover a little bit of stuff on both. And it's like, Hey, you know, even if you don't do this now, remember this because you're going to want it later if you ever decide to dip your toe in the other pond. Yeah. I, I also think sometimes it's, it's, it's important to, you know, like to learn some things you might not think you need because you'll be surprised how much you need them. Like the, the, the example I always use is, is the is the booming culture of online coaching right now, whereas online coaching now was either a five, 10 years ago was either someone did as a side hustle or it was something that someone went into after five, 10 years of the industry and they just needed to scale their business. Whereas now you see people never being on the gym floor coming into this. And it's like, that's where people may skip, say, well, your biomechanics course because they're not on the gym floor. But as soon as your client comes in on a check-in and go, I'm getting a bit of knee pain on this exercise, you have no idea what to do. And even if it might not be your day to day, I think it's so important to have a much more wide round sort of knowledge and i'm like like you i'm very i'm very much I, I need to block myself in time for a hobby because i've got a little bit of adhd in the sense of i can struggle to focus for on the simplest of tasks one day and have hyper focus till 4 a.m not looking up for my laptop the next day just because a client didn't feel something the way i thought and the setup looked right and i'm there going i need to work this out and i won't settle in for a day that's exactly why I retired from coaching because it allows me to be, it allows me to apply all of my personality defects to this stuff um, <laughs> and not have to sacrifice the, the service of coaching, right? Like yeah. to be a good coach, you need to be able to put the client first. And I was like, you know, if I want to do, if I want to take in one where I want to take one, one, I, I have to remove any obstacles and just let my brain do what it wants to do and mm. just, just go straight after this, this one thing. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I, I've, I've never re- seen the phrase until I tried to do a bit of online and one-to-one at the same time that like, lacking on sleep is borrowing from the next day. You're not getting extra time on that day. You're borrowing from the next day. Yeah, and then, I, it, you, then you, you know, your first couple of clients, you're sort of just trying to caffeinate yourself and wake yourself up. You know, like, how did you, like, do you find, because now I'm starting to do more online coaching myself, I find them in a way very different skills. Um, in the oh, sense yeah. of, does, uh, you, you know, you'll think long-term programming for your one-to-one clients, but you'll often get people who are well, affording personal training, for the most part, are probably going to be office workers, bankers, finance guys, busy guys like that, where they may not have everything dialed in outside the gym. They may come in five, 10 minutes late, and you're thinking of the micro. Let's set them up. Let's work around injuries. Let's do this. Whereas when you've got an online coach, it's now, right, let's set you up for the next six years. Do you find that with what you do now moving away from the gym floor and working with clients at M1 or because of the kind of clientele you get, it still becomes a little bit of everything? Yeah, well, I think it kind of depends on what the niche you had as a one-on-one client. If you're working with general pop, what tends to happen if you move to online is, is that you tend to get a, we'll say a slightly more advanced clientele. Because they're they're obviously confident. I mean, it's not one hundred percent that, but they're obviously confident that they can, you know, use less instruction to be successful, right? Um, you know, and obviously you're giving up control of the session per se. I mean, you might you might be writing them a program, but you can't tell them to do two more in the middle of a set, you know, in that program. You can't adjust their form and all that other stuff live. So, in my opinion, there are certain. I mean, there's definitely skills that have to be very different. Um, both from a communication standpoint and whatnot, but I would make the argument that if you want to talk about the people that deliver the absolute best online coaching, that they, their skill set has to be better because they have to be able to communicate things in a subopt, like using a suboptimal format, right? Like they have to be able to like, okay, I got to be able to send this a video. I got to send it over text or, you know, I got to in a voice message, et cetera. Whereas, you know, being able to communicate something with a client by simply like moving their arm or adjusting a cable forward, like all of those things um, and being able to like 
on the day ask those questions of like, well, what did you do last night? Or what did you eat today? Or, you know, what's going on? Like to have that like on the day feedback that makes your life a lot easier. And to be able to communicate in those direct mechanisms makes it a lot easier. As an online coach, you now don't have that great communication skill, right? And you don't have that on the day feedback. You have to be like, all right, maybe I get check-ins once a week, two weeks, a month, whatever, however your, your system is set up. Um, so you have to be more analytical. You have to look at more metrics or you just, you have to be just so much better at communicating or providing resources and all that stuff. You, you have to predict all of the obstacles that your clients are going to run into so that you can have a resource ready that you, so you can communicate that better than just simply trying to write something back in an email or whatever. Right. So like a big part of, you know, what we did before we did any online programs or whatever, is we built a huge exercise library and a ton of articles and all of that other stuff. Cause it's like, look, it, it, this process will be terrible, you know, at least by our standards, if we don't have just this huge library of, of resources to be able to afford a client. So that way, when they have a question on something, one, you don't have to write the same email like 5,000 times, yeah. but you also have a way of delivering that information that is in more depth than what you would be able to cover in a simple response. And maybe if it's the combination of, you know, text and video and audio and images, et cetera, you provide it in a way where you can communicate that information as good as possible, right? Yeah. So I think if, you're, if you wanna be good at online, you actually have to have more tools in your toolbox and you have to be better at communicating those tools. And that's not to take any way, anything away from people that train in person. It's just, you have a lot of luxuries when you're training people in person. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's really, really important. You said that about the resources and the back end of what you built it and want to, to help your online clients, because, you know, the, it's in the name N equals one. That's that it's a very personalized service. And I find often when I, I work with coaches, especially online coaches, it's like they confuse a truly tailored experience with, I've got to start with a blank piece of paper, otherwise it's not personal. And I think, you know, like that, I, in my argument, I think that's a less personal service because if I've got, okay, I can take my intake form of a questionnaire. I've got rough ideas of what, the, what my various problems are for the stimuluses that I'm looking to achieve. I have articles to help them out, I've got my exercise library, I've got everything there ready to go. And then I go, right. What does he struggle with in terms of his range? What's his recovery like? Okay, like a tree. This is the right thing for him. I tweak this here and here and on it goes. Whereas that person that starts with a blank piece of paper can often get overwhelmed with like, where do I start? And it takes four or five days for a client to get the program to you. And like, mm -hmm. that's the time you could have been actually coaching. Like that initial program, you know, as specific as you are, I'm sure you'll agree that it's, it's about getting something to them first, seeing how they get on and going, okay, that, that needs to change, that needs to change, that needs to change there. But if you end up spending so long on that initial part because you're starting from scratch, it's a, mo a mammoth process where your client can tune out before they even start. Yeah, it's the difference between pursuing, you know, perfection and progress, right? Like the people that want to do everything completely from scratch, they're like, I have this person. And so I want to make that perfect, like that first program, that first everything perfect for them. And while the idea of that is nice, the economics of it are terrible, uh, for one, right? The amount of time it'll take and, and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But also, because the client is a factor, it just tends to be a waste because a client can only implement so many changes to their lifestyle and their training. Like they have a learning curve, right? Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you, if you had everything perfect because they're not going to do it perfectly. So you have to find that balance of like, how can I provide them the best starting point that then now the thing that I just gave them is now the new assessment point. So then we can improve upon that for the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, and that's what I try and instill on, on people that tend to be a little myopic with, you know, how they're looking at, you know, individualized stuff. I mean, individualized, there's a lot of things that you can do, you know, to, we'll say, streamline that process but still be very thoughtful initially in terms of like exercise selection the stimulus and all of that stuff right um but you're not you're, you're not going to have somebody like okay week one i need you to like watch this these six hours of you know videos or whatever so that you do everything right you know you calculate every macro right you do all of your lifestyle stuff right you do every exercise perfectly you track your rpes or rirs and all that other stuff you know you know, just, I just need you to come become a completely different person in 24 hours. Could you do that for me? Cause that would make my job so much easier, but that's, you know, that's never going to happen. Your goal is to get them 
to be a, you know, we'll say a decently better version of themselves over the course of, you know, like weeks and months of habit building, right. And practice and application. So when it comes to obviously like, like data tracking there, you mentioned a few times and, and obviously that's a very important part of anything, but there is always that line, especially with newer clients where that data tracking becomes too much. Like when you're mm-hmm. taking on new cloud, what do you consider the important things for someone to keep an eye on that will guide your process as a coach? And where do you, what do you know? How do you start to layer on um, data points as you go through a process? Yeah, so when we do our initial assessment, when I'm trying to figure it out, are, are looking at data in two ways. I'm trying to figure out which data points are going to be physiologically the most important, right? But also I'm trying to think of what are the things that this person is capable and willing to do that will have basically the lowest cost for them, either time, effort, money, et cetera, right? And you're trying to find the combination of those two because sometimes the win is picking a bunch of things for your client that basically they have no objection to and require no extra time investment or, or whatever, you know, um, like for, if, so for instance, this is an example I like to use, like, you know, there's tons of controversial topics. You say anything, you know, you say like, Oh, blue blockers, right. That's an example. Right. And some people are like, Oh, blue blockers are stupid. Like, you know, you, you're, they're wasting your money and whatever. I'm like, well, if you have a lot of money and putting on blue blockers is like a zero objectionable thing for you to do, but, you know, but putting off of your screen or not watching the movie with your spouse or whatever it is, is much more objectionable Then it's like, we'll throw the money at the blue blockers. Cause that's, that's the, you know, it may not be the best change, but if it's a zero cost to the client, they're, they're willing to implement it, you know, no questions asked. Sure. Like, Ooh, I can wear those things. But no. Like then why, why wouldn't you be like, okay, why don't we start there? Cause if that makes a little bit of a difference, then I have buy-in for them to maybe work towards a change that was a little bit more objectionable. Right. So I'm trying to look at the physiological stuff of like, okay, what do we absolutely have to do? Right. And if, you know, if I can get by not having to force, especially a brand new client to do any of the things that they would consider most objectionable, right? And usually if you if you do an interview, you kind of get an idea of like, you know, like a, a readiness to change type of assessment on them, right? Um, but you also, you know, you ask about their lifestyle and the stuff that they want to do or, or whatever, right? So if you have, you know, one of the questions that I'll often ask is like, well, okay, you know, would you rather work twice as hard or eat half as much? Because that just lets me psychologically know right there, yeah. you know, what, 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 what am I likely going to be able to manage here a little bit more objectively? Like, okay, so maybe this person I'll be better off, like, you know, pushing their training, convincing them to do an extra session, getting steps in or whatever, versus being super neurotic about tracking, you know, their food or whatever. Maybe I go, all right, let's try and go with a less objectionable thing on the nutrition side. And we can go for a more aggressive thing on the training side. Cause I know compliance wise and lifestyle wise, they're just going to, you know, conform to that better. So that's what I'm looking at. So I don't have like this is, I mean, obviously you can throw the big ones out there, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I'm looking at sleep, you know, that, that's a huge one, you know, and just digest, like just trying to figure out like, does this person have any, you know, major health problems, right? Or whatever. So I can be like, oh yeah. Like, I wonder whether they're not recovering this week. Oh, you've been, you know, peeing out your butthole the whole week because, you know, you don't tolerate this thing or whatever. Like, it's like really small story here. So pro bodybuilder um, goes to one of the, we'll say biggest names names in, you know, the coaching, you know, industry in terms of like, you know, the Olympias won't drop any names. Right. But the, the, the information that bodybuilder gives this, you know, elite level coach is, is like, I don't tolerate dairy or peanut butter very well, blah, 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 whatever. Right. 50% of the meals were whey protein and peanut butter. Right. For the bodybuilder that says, I don't tolerate dairy and peanut butter. Right. And I'm like, but guess what? Bodybuilding <laughs> did the diet anyway. And I mean, I'm sure you can guess what the result is, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, so, you know, that's where it's like, okay, you know, the, what's the most important data point might be different on some mm-hmm. people, right? Like, so like from the nutritional standpoint, sometimes, you know, it'll be more of a, you know, the structuring of it, and then it will be the macros at the beginning, right? Because people, you know, if you have that person, it's like, I just, you know, I'm just so hungry at night and like, okay, well, we have to resolve that issue before I'm saying, Hey, you have to eat this many calories or whatever. 
right? Because it's like, if that, if, if the, if the obstacle is going to be like, well, we'll set this, you'll calculate it. But then at night you're going to be binging with this or whatever. But like, okay, why don't we start tracking, you know, things that are relevant to what makes you hungry at night and what things would maybe change that, et cetera. Um, I think, you know, when I was over there, we did like the fruit before bed thing, yeah, right? Yeah. For some people, right? And it's like, you know, for, you know, for some people like, you know, like Charles would have rolled over in his grade if he was like, oh, you got your, your, your fat loss client, you know, that's like 40% obese, like giant stuff's and you're going to slam fruit before bed. I'm like, yeah, but all of a sudden they sleep and all their blood sugar markers get better. Like, so context yeah. matters, right? I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really interesting talking about the, 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 the bodybuilder story. And, and it, it, it's, I think it's important. Like, this goes back. I always find podcasts go full circle at various points. And this goes back in terms of the education and knowing more than you maybe think you need to know with a client. And I remember a very similar story with a client with dairy. And this is more the client's thing than mine. And I always ask in my intake forms, obviously, as you should, is there any things that you don't, that don't agree with you? Is there any food intolerances that you're aware of? It's like just eggplant. And, I, and I, I know sometimes how people just rush through those forms and they're half paying attention. So I say it again, initials, like, is there anything at all that gives you any symptoms whatsoever? Like, no, no, just eggplant. So I sent him his meal plan. And for the first few weeks, like, the, 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 the targets I'd given him in his food was completely way off. And every week I was like, hey, you know your protein's like 10 grams and your carbs like 500. You know, like we set this this way. He's like, oh, okay. Next week, same thing. Next week, same thing. And eventually I was like, okay let's sit down what are we doing here why is it what's what's struggling because where can i help you and he thought i generally owned my fitness pal and he thought the targets that my fitness pal set him were the targets that i would given him i'm like no remember that meal plan i walked you through like put them into my fitness pal here let me do it <laughs> and then a week later he, he, he comes to me he goes uh i've been taking your protein powder that you you put in the meal plan i'm like okay he goes uh is it meant to be burning and i went or maybe you've got some issues with dairy you weren't aware about. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm lactose intolerant. I'm just like... And, like, and, that, and, that, and that's an extreme example of somebody who's was yeah. like, no issues, no issues, no issues, no issues. But if I could have spent another six, eight weeks so I hadn't been aware of some of the symptoms that he was facing um, and go track it back to sort of there. Um, but going on to the data thing, one of the things that's the important part in, in all of your courses, it's, it's in your you know, nutrition and program design course. It's in the pre-course um, information for your um, in-person seminars. It's the concept of trainability, which essentially encompasses this. And it's it's something that I, I thought was put in a really unique way that I thought um, really resonated with the way how I like to work and gave you many more options with how to approach someone's programming. So could you just overview of what, what trainability is and how you use it within your coaching? Yeah. So trainability basically is the measure of how much of a certain stimulus that you will need to get a positive adaptation. Um, and essentially, you know, as we start to train in any specific way, that threshold starts to go up. We start to need more stimulus to continue to progress, right? Like if you start running, if you want to learn, if you want to run faster, then you've got to you know, try to run faster. If you want to be able to run longer, then you got to try and run longer. If you want to lift heavier weights, then you got to lift, you know, lift heavier weights and you got to lift them with more volume and intensity, like all of those things. And our physiology works in the same way in that basically once we kind of receive a stress in our body, it says like, okay, we don't like that, or that's slightly objectionable. Let's, let's have an adaptation response, right? Genes turn on, proteins get synthesized, all sorts of wonderful things happen. But now the next time you meet that same stress, if you have adapted well enough, it's going to be like, we don't need to change. We handle this now, right? And so the concept of trainability is essentially trying to figure out what things that you can do with an individual that won't take a lot of stress and effort. Because if you periodize appropriately, we're always decreasing our trainability in the thing that we're working on, but other things that we may not be stressing are increasing their trainability. They're becoming the low hanging fruit. Uh, and this is one of the benefits of, you know, kind of periodizing around through different types of stresses is that instead of having to like, just progress, 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 more harder, 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 you can simply rotate the things that you're doing appropriate to that person. And then all of a sudden you are more sensitive. It doesn't take as much volume or as much effort, you know, to get the same or better benefit as the last time that you did it. Um, and so, it's just being mindful of a little bit of the physiology so that you can kind of understand, will this person benefit from this type of stress? Because there are stresses 
that a person can have that aren't training related, but will overlap with training, right? For example, if somebody has a bunch of chronic inflammation, training in a way where inflammation is one of the key components of that adaptation probably isn't going to be good because they already have chronic inflammation. So guess what? Like they're not going to get much of a positive experience in throwing more inflammation in their system, right? It might even be worse, right? Because it becomes a point in time where the, what you would need for a positive response is just outweighed by the stress, right? So it's just like, you know, there's, there's no benefit from it. Um, so what you would want to do is you would want to purposely train them in a way and switch over their nutrition and lifestyle, et cetera. So basically you were eliminating as many of those causes of inflammation and everything could calm down. And then while you're doing your other stuff, then that would resensitize. And then you could go back to that type of training. So one of the things that we typically do is whatever a goal a person comes in with, the initial program that we put them on, if it's a person that's been training is almost never something they would directly associate with that goal. Like the majority of the people that come to get jacked end up going through some sort of conditioning protocol initially. Cause it's like, yeah, great. You might even be like 6% body fat. Right. But, but, but you're out of, like, you're a turd, you're out of shape. Like this is me sitting here talking this, uh, like, you know, like 19% body fat, but anyway, um, but you know, I just climbed a mountain, so I'm, I'm in shape fat. So say that, right. But I mean, that's essentially, that's essentially what you're trying to do is, is like, Hey, how do I get the, how do I make it as easy as possible for this person to progress rather than trying to push them towards a goalpost? That's like just moving up a steeper and steeper incline away from them. Right. When I could just say, Hey, why don't we take a week or two, a psych, you know, a phase, a cycle over here, and then we can come back to that and we'll make progress there much easier. And so we tend to use shorter mesocycles and rotate things around a little bit more than what you typically see in the industry. Hmm. Um, and a big part of that is just us trying to say, Hey, we can move towards the goal, but instead of having to move in a straight line, what we can do is we can zig and zag and actually get there faster over time, because as we're zigging and zagging, we'll be able to move there with less effort. Right. It's like we're zigging and zagging on a flat surface instead of trying to move in a straight line uphill. It's yeah. kind of an analogy that makes more sense when I draw it. But if you can imagine, like if you were, if you were zigzagging left and right, but you were going, you were running flat, that would be less effort than running up a very steep, you know, incline that just kept getting, you know, harder and harder and harder. Yeah. That makes sense. I, I also think as well, it, it, it offers you ability to plug some of those weaknesses that probably people don't think about. Right. I mean, if you get someone that comes in, their goal is hypertrophy and they've probably gone, hypertrophy the whole of their last year of training they may have delved into a little bit of strength and when they think of addressing weak points they think of my triceps are affecting my bench press or you know yeah. my, my lats aren't strong enough as opposed to thinking do you know when i get to 10 reps on a leg press i am gassed so like going yeah. into some sort of systemic block maybe not only pulling them away from that stimulus but also could be plugging the gap that stops the hypertrophy cycle actually yeah. being progressive so when you come back to it and only the ready for that stimulus they're also much better place for us to get more from it in the first place. Like I, I recently started working with Blake from um, Anna Cress's team and I, the same, same sort of thing. I was out of shape by my standards. I'd enjoyed dim sum and Hong Kong lifestyle way too much over the last two years. And I was put on a like straight on a systemic half body split. And I hadn't done that in years. And as horrible as it was for those three weeks, I am, I'm so glad I went through that process. Like every phase after that was better as opposed to I was recovering better. I was performing better. And my, particularly my leg training, it wasn't my heart rate that was giving away. It actually was my muscles. And I actually got more out of those things. But when it comes to being very specific with the stimulus, this is something I've always been intrigued about is that if you get somebody who is maybe a little bit more deconditioned and what is, what would be a sort of systemic, you know, aerobically based stimulus for, for, someone else maybe half of what it is for them right because their conditioning isn't yeah. where it needs to be like how specific can you be with those kind of people and how much of it is like how does fatigue play a role because i can imagine that if you put this perfect sort of hypertrophy split with them or strength split the a series becomes very targeted but by the time you get to the c series the amount of fatigue will surely push them into a sort of different threshold do you find that or is it not the case if that makes sense well Okay. So the thing is, is that once you kind of figure out the stimulus that doesn't, there isn't like one way to write a program for that stimulus. Right. So, um, and this is a course we've only taught live, uh, which is a program design course that hopefully we'll be moving, 
um, to the online portion here in 2022. But what we do is, is like for a given stimulus, we go through, okay, here's the architecture of different types of programs. So for instance, German body comp, right? That's, that's, a, that, that, that's like an architecture of programming, right? Where it's just like, okay, we're supersetting, you know, upper, lower body, you know, you can call it peripheral heart method or whatever, right? And you, there's that general structure of you like, you have the A's, B's, C's, whatever. And so, and different, a different archetype that we went over when I was with you guys is we talked about backloading, right? Which was just simply, we took the exercises that are typically the A's, which were your big output exercise, and we just moved them to the end. And that's a totally now different experience and it allows you to do and focus on different things, right? And that's probably like one of the smallest changes in archetype. But like once you get into hypertrophy, it's like, man, there are so many strategies that you can take to now approach, approach the stimulus. And some will be better for somebody that's doing a lot of volume over, you know, very few days. Some will be better for somebody that's doing, you know, higher frequency, but lower volume per day. Some will be better for just higher volume overall, lower volume all. Some will be better for a person that's limited on exercise. Somebody, some will be better for a person that has like every exercise in the matchable, whatever. So, you know, so there's all of these different ways to approach that physiological goal. Right. Um, and this is where I, I really enjoy the creative creativity of program design. Right? This is like, okay, now that we've separated stimulus, I know exactly what I want this combination of exercises and sets and reps and tempos and all of these things. I know what I want that physiological outcome to be. And now I have the constraints of the person, which is, you know, how many times, how long they can work out, you know, their relative skill, you know, their, how much fatigue they can tell all of these other things, you know, how, how close to failure can we get? Um, and then I can be like, all right, how do I take their limitations, but also build something that will accomplish this goal, right? And I, so you can be very specific, but it has to be more specific than the stimulus, right? The stimulus gets you to what you want to accomplish physiologically, but now the nuts and bolts that you use to accomplish that, then you have, there's, a, there's a ton of latitude for that, right? I mean, let's like a very simple one is like local metabolic, right? It's like, well, what are all the different ways that you can make a single tissue work harder, longer? You could just do higher reps. You could do supersets. You could do tri-sets, giant sets, drop sets, cluster. Like there's just so many different ways, right? And, you know, one of those might be good on the squat, but terrible on a leg extension. And another might one, you know, might be, you know, the reverse, right? So like, for instance, like remember Charles is like 20 rep breathing squats or whatever, or you like you do a rep and the, imagine trying to do that on like, like, you know, like a bicep curl or a leg extension, or <laughs> yeah. right? You wouldn't do, you wouldn't do 20 singles probably, right? Like, um, I mean, it sucks for squats, but I mean, if we're just talking about physiologically, sure, it's like, it yeah, that probably would not be how I, how I do that. So it's just, you, you have so many ways and you can figure out like, well, what's going to be the best for this particular person? Is it going to be just to use high reps or do we need to find a way to make that rep? Do we need to figure a way to make 20 reps more intense by making it a superset of 10 and then another 10 so that the first 10 can be at a relative higher intensity? Like which one of those is going to apply better to this, this individual, right? Or yeah. does it need to be even further? It needs to be a tri-set, right? Or it needs to be a drop set, et cetera. I think, I think that so could, for instance, it's got, there you go. I was just gonna say, it's like, so, so really another simple one is like, look, if you have access to tons of exercises and like I can split up the divisions of the pecs or triceps or whatever it may mm. be, it's like, cool. Then supersets and triceps are awesome. You have very little equipment. Uh, well, then drop sets work really good when you only have one, one exercise, right? Or mechanical drops, right? Or rest pauses or like, you know, so you, I, I keep using the phrase for the people that are coming to the events. It's like, look, just pretend you're a kid again right? And instead of stressing about this stuff, enjoy the figuring it out process, right? Because if you don't enjoy that, then you probably shouldn't have a job where you write programs all day, because yeah. you're going to be miserable. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think that's really important. It comes almost full circle about having a system again. And we spoke about like creating a system in your program and how that creates more individualization in programs. I think this is really key. Like I, I remember for a while, I, I was working on like, how do I teach program design to the, the trainers that I, I worked with and mentored at the time and certainly on a, a many to one setting which also you're way more familiar with than I am I was like if I created a tick list if I created some pillars of where program design is so let's say you know you pick your periodization you pick your stimulus as, as number one now that, that goes from I've got a blank piece of paper with all these informations and where does a drop set where's the where, where is this it's just so complicated it's like right hypertrophy Cool. So now we have the reps. That's already taken care of. That probably takes care of 
a range of rest periods that we're probably going to use and a set range we're not going to use. We're not going to do, you know, 18 sets of 10. You know, that'd be a three hour workout. So it just, it guides your decision-making process down, but it does become play because all the, there's a system around all the big things that when you get to the gym floor component, it's like, right, I've got all these parameters and that's how I play and work around what's going to be the best way of doing this. And like some of the best lessons I've ever, ever learned has been getting on the gym floor and doing stuff. Some very, very sensible stuff, some very dumb stuff that I've taken Okay, there's one to two percent of this that's really good, like the the old ten exercise giant set UP hypertrophy leg days, right? Like I would never give most of my clients a ten exercise giant set on quads, but the things I learned from going through that process mentally and physically are really important. And I remember doing a workout was with an old colleague of mine, and it was just between Christmas and New Year. We hadn't trained for a week, and we're like should we just do a workout to get back into it? And we just wrote this workout out on paper. We weren't thinking too much about it. it was just like, let's just do a full body, you know, death circuit to get us back in. Nothing crazy and load. And we did Nordic curls, ring push-ups, And then the killers here were a Bulgarian split squat, left leg into um, left arm, single arm row, then into right leg, Bulgarian split squat, into right arm, single arm row. And I was like, the difference that if I didn't know straight sets or if I put those exercises at the opposite end of the circuit, how different that feeling and that effect and that stimulus would have been just by doing upper lower, upper lower within the same two superset was unbelievable. And if someone can, can, you know, can actually do that, there's a potentially a lot of benefits there. And it only came from playing on the gym floor. And I think it's, it's something that I think a lot of coaches myself on, again, going back to that, going straight into the online thing, one of the things I always encourage people to do when they, when they study, it's like, right, you've learned the anatomy of the pec. You've gone and watched a video from Cass or John Shallow or whoever about how it actually works. Now get on the gym floor and play around with stuff because that's sort of how you really learn how it truly works and see and visualize it. I think a big thing that the new generation of coaches is missing out on. Um, and I, I, I give Cody, who's one of our younger um, guys, shit about this all the time is is that like we went around to all of these courses and in that era everybody was just trying to come up basically with a different way to kill you that's essentially like the like people were just coming up with just like the most disgusting pro like this was before there was anything like rpe was not a thing right yeah, there were yeah. there were no reps left or whatever right so the 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 workouts and the suffering that like we went through in that era um and the the amount of things that you learned both from a character building perspective but also mm -hmm. like you know if you do a lot of hard things you start to realize the nuanced differences in those hard things and what makes you know the hardest things really really hard and, and whatnot um and i think you know there are so many people now that are jumping into this industry that it's not that i don't want to say that they've just never trained hard but they definitely have not been exposed to a lot of very challenging things in the gym that you just you just can't learn about by reading reading about them right and that's that's one of the reasons that like at the practicals you know that we make people train hard right so i mean you, the workout that you guys went through because there was like 50 of you guys or whatever right like that was grueling what was there was like a it was, it was like 16, 16 circuits or something like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with that. I think some of the best lessons, the best, you know, things I've got from courses is like getting hands on and getting like, a play, I can't think of a better word than play on the gym floor and, and mm -hmm. learning these things firsthand, which I, I do think is, is less common today. And as well, I think like, this is where sometimes I think the over-reliance sometimes on research without the practical application of it can be a hindrance because people read into RER and RPE and they think about their training in a bigger picture. It's like, okay, this day will affect this day and this, and then, which is great. And we want that. That's progression in the industry. But at the same time, the amount of times where you've gone, right, we're going to do a team training in this session so you can learn how to train. Oh yeah, but I'm, I'm on prep and I've got to do, I've got to do biceps tomorrow and this back session will affect that. And I'm like, I used to train legs every Friday at 10 a.m. with Eddie Barua. And like, it did, he, he didn't give a fuck what you had on Saturday's training session. <laughs> you just did it. And like, sometimes, yeah, that was a hindrance. But I tell you what, I learned more from getting out of my comfort zone 
and being stuck in and sort of evolved in, in, in you know, embedded in that sort of process um, that I know what's useful and what's not. I think the industry's gotten a little, we'll say anti-discovery, meaning that mm. it's not like, when, like if like it's even for me, right. And, you know, my following, you know, I'm very transparent with them. So if I just decide to play around in the gym, you know, or whatever, and, you know, I was like, Hey, I, I rigged up this exercise or whatever. I did this thing or whatever today. And I'm just, I thought it was cool. I'm sharing it with you guys. Like the number of people that will just want to, you know, just poo poo that idea or, or whatever. Like, you know, it's like, so I can only imagine what it's like for somebody that doesn't have the authority that I have. Right. And it's yeah. like, well, I just want to try this out, you know, you know, or, you know, my friend, my buddy or whatever trains at this other gym, you know, maybe it's a CrossFit or whatever. I just decided to go and <coughs> see what it was like. Right. And the amount of, amount of hate, right. The amount of people that will just tell you like, oh, you're stupid and whatever, you know, cause you did that thing. And I'm like, so I decided to go do something on my Saturday and you had nothing better to do than to get on the internet and talk bad about the thing that I actually went and did. Yeah. Awesome, dude. <laughs> I think, I think like, this brings me on to a question. I think it's probably one of the, if there's one you're going to go off on a tangent with, I mean, I'm, I'm all welcome. It's probably going to be this one, but you kind of led into it quite nicely. Um, but I, I've, 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 I've known you for a while. I've known you speak about wanting to bring integrity to this, this industry. And it's something that's very keep shown on everything you do. To the point where you've almost become almost like the sheriff of the fitness industry. And you've almost had a number of debates over the last few years. And, you know, and, and, and certainly you think that, you know, that becomes an important part of this industry. How, certainly in today's world, in 2021, for, in anything, but fitness is obviously what we know. How, what is the importance you think of intellectual debate today? And do you feel that it's 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 being lost? Um, it's it's definitely becoming much much more of a challenge, right? Mm. So, the obstacles that I've I've had, right? And mm. you know, my intention is not to be the sheriff in the in the industry, but I'm not a one. I'm not afraid to share my opinions on things. Yes. Um, and I tend to be very objective rather than just saying, you know, like that guy's an idiot or I don't like that. Yeah. I tend to always give an explanation and somehow that often actually has more of a negative interaction, you know, from the person with the opposing viewpoint than if you were to just like blatantly insult them or, or whatever, like that seems to be more acceptable and people are, but if you actually provide, you know, a logic or thought that's contrary and then that's where it becomes really bad. But the challenge for me has been able to find people that are, one enjoy having the debate but two can understand that like you can you can disagree about with something and it is not it is not personal mm. right like the person that has proved me the wrong the most of my career is me right mm. so and i try not to hate myself too much for that right i try to try to appreciate that and that i think you know we're we're in this this place where you have people that you know if someone disagrees with them you know, they take it personal, which means the debate quickly, like just degrades to non-productive stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's also, it, it, it's challenging now because I think, you know, I wish we had a platform or some way, some format where we could organize intellectual debate. I mean, podcasts right now are essentially the only thing that we have. So the yeah. few podcasts where people get on and talk to each other is about it, right? But if I reach out to somebody that I disagree with and say, hey, let's talk about this, um, you know, very, very few people will take me up onto that, right? Yeah. So like, I mean, you mentioned Jordan Shallow. He's one of the very few. Uh, Pat Davidson, Tito, right? right, and is another one. Um, well, kind of like Pat, like, you know, we, we talked about one topic or whatever, but then, I, but now Pat will never like, debate or discuss with me ever again that's like the, the current status okay. um so i thought i thought it but i was wrong okay. um you know but i mean no like i crave that because i'm addicted to wanting like if i'm wrong i want to figure i want to figure it out now and i want to know why yeah. um and i also just love discussing the nuances of it right because there's a lot of things where it's there's a lot of things where two people can not be wrong right now because we just don't have enough information yeah. to know what's right and a lot of people are not willing to accept that and i'm totally willing to say hey i believe in the argument that i have you believe in a different argument we can make those arguments together but if neither one of us has a good enough case 
to make the other person completely change our views, what, that does not mean that we have to hate each other. That means that we should both be, all right, I know there's another argument out there that has maybe some valid, or at least some people think that this is you know, a valid case. So as I'm continuing my thought process, I need to keep that. That's that's like that's the way of me kind of fighting my biases is of being as aware as possible and steel manning the other position as much as possible, right? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's one of those things that you know the people people are we're in a world now, especially with social media, where you can find Instagram accounts and Facebook accounts that that follow your confirmation bias. That the ego has become more and more fragile as people go through this, you know, go through life. And not just in this, you know, we're in a world where Mr. Potato Head can't be a mister, you know, and we're killing off male role models in cinema, left, right, and center. So, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where camps become really, really, you know, opinionated. And I think often you mention the people that don't respond well to these things, it's probably because they'd rather be called a dick because they can ignore that comment. But as soon as someone comes in and gives another another side of the story that's where the ego then has to take a hit and you know i i've always you know i've always encouraged it because i'm I'm generally one of these people that i said at the start of this podcast imposter syndrome i consider as a positive thing because it allows me to get better and put myself in environments and circles that are going to challenge my way of thinking and i don't think you can do that by surrounding yourself with people that just think you're the best um yeah but as you said it's like you've managed to get on and have these debates with these people and you may not agree but it doesn't mean like you're now working together to find something a common ground i'm sure if you both came to a conclusion that there's not enough information out there i'm sure you would go and tell this person when there was more information out there and vice versa you've now become working for the same cause rather than being opposite sides of the coin just some a, a proper conversation there used to be this industry where basically, you know, somebody would, you know, they would have evidence of something, right? Mm-hmm. And basically the whole goal of another group would be to figure out if that was true and disprove it or whatever. And we used to call that science. Um, but I, it just seems to be something we we don't do. Or we're not interested in, in, in that mindset um, anymore. And I can understand, we'll, we'll put it this way, I can sympathize and empathize with you know, the people that are just trying to focus on their business, because obviously, like, and, and that's, I mean, if, if you if, if, if I was to teach a business course or whatever, um, it would be a pretty shitty business course, because the way I do things is very particular to our brand, mm-hmm. right? And it requires you to have a product, we'll say as, as good as ours. Um, and what a lot of a lot of people like, if their focus is on building the business, they would make very different decisions than what we've done. And my thought has been, if I do the things that focus on the integrity of our brain and the information and whatnot, the, the business will fall in place, which is good for me because I have very little interest in focusing on the business things. So mm-hmm. I'm basically trying to use my skills to the best of my ability and hope that that pays off in, in the long run. But I understand, you know, you, you might, you might have a business that takes a lot of your time. Right. And, you know, you might be like, Hey, whatever these debates are, these nuance, they're, they're not relevant to, you know, maybe you sell a product that's like for beginners or, or whatnot and stuff. So I, I just think for a lot of people, if they're in this for the business perspective, there's a kind of a cap on their intellectual pursuit for it. Once the business achieves, once it scales to either a certain amount of time commitment, a certain amount of financial access or whatever, there's a lot of different reasons where then people are just like, Oh, okay. I mean, and you will see this consistently. Um, and this is what I'm hoping, like, I don't know when you're going to watch this, but I'm getting really close to that hundred thousand followers uh, on Instagram or whatever. But what you'll see is a lot of people start changing the content they produce and every, once they reach us, like, it's like, once they put in enough work to reach a certain success threshold, it's now all it is. It's like, well, how do I capitalize on that more? Yeah. from a business perspective, right? So it's like, okay, I got this many followers, cool. So should we continue trying to innovate the product? Now, nah, keep selling the product, same one we'll sell for a decade. But why don't we also start selling supplements and clothing? And I'm not taking jabs at anybody that does those things, right? You know, we may do those things in the future. Um, but it just seems that like, you know, if you're focused on the business, you're going to focus on the things going to have the biggest impact on the business. And if right now the quality of your product is not keeping anybody from buying it, a lot of people are going to be like, oh, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Mm. Um, and my obsessive nature is just such that we have been 
we've been changing our product the whole time that we've been in existence, right? So my 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 staff, you know, you they probably hate me, you know, deep down a lot for you know the number of times that you know we were like, oh, you know, I don't like that. Let's go, let's let's redo that module. Let's oh, the, you know, let's let's retweak how we're saying this, how we're teaching this. You know, aha, uh -huh, you know, um, you know, we used to teach pecs that way. Well, guess not, we're not, we're not doing that anymore. Um, you know, etc. And and. But I enjoy it like that is the that is where in the business I want to be. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so the other aspect of it, I think, is just that social media is anti nuance. It's anti nuance and there's no segregation, meaning that, you know, for me to have a discussion with somebody that I would consider, you know, on par, you know, as an intellectual or whatever. Right. And that's not me trying to talk down, but it's like, you know, if somebody has enough reputation then I know that it might be worth having a conversation, right. Mm -hmm. You know, but just person with no pro profile picture up or whatever, just shows up and be like, you're stupid, blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, I'm going to hit that block button. People are like, Oh, so this person disagreed with you and you just blocked them. And I'm like, there's a big difference between me wanting to debate other people that who I respect their, you know, contrarian thoughts on this versus people that just have nothing better to do and are, you know, are completely dishonest yeah. with where they are in their own education and whatnot. And they just want to come on and just like assume that, Hey, if I have a different opinion than this person, that that person then owes me their time. I always think that's funny. Like yeah, when somebody requests a debate and I'm like, I have no idea who you are, like, or what you do or, or whatever. Right. Like I see no business, no following, no credentials, no nothing. You're just, you just, you, you just, you just colors on the screen that, that, that that's all you are. And you, so you're asking me at my stage in my career to take my time away from what I'm doing yeah. and then come down and argue with you because you have a really bad idea. You can right? tell subtext yeah. as well, right? You can tell subtext. Yes. The, when someone comments on a post, you can say this person, regardless whether it's the following or not, even a small following, this person wants to learn more. This person is trying to understand while this person is, I'm criticizing because if I criticize and I get it right, or if I, other people think I get it right, people see me as also an expert and will follow my page, which is a very dishonest way of actually having a debate. You're not having a debate because you want to know the answer. You're having a debate because it might get more eyes on your profile, which sort of defeats the point. I actually see less of that. And I see more people that are just criticizing because they're bored. Because we'll put it this way. The majority of the trolls that I have on my, that come on my page are not anybody that's known. Like I almost never get any contrary, like anybody that comes in and says anything negative that is somebody that's known or somebody whose account that I can go to and see their business. I would say probably 80 to 90% of the time, it's somebody where if I click on their profile, it goes nowhere. It's like, it's a, it's a nothing account with like, you know, like it's like, I, you could be a bot for all for, for for all I know, right? So so clearly they're not trying to drive traffic to that. Um, and a lot of times it's those are like, you know, people make like you know multiple accounts and do all that wonderful stuff now or whatever, right? So, um, pe people that have a lot of extra time, but I I just think that right now um, people are I mean people are intellectually bored in the world right now, and I don't think I think I think social media is a great outlet for all that, and it doesn't seem to be you know, very productive, which is why, you know, man, having more of the, you know, having more people producing good content so that people have a better outlet to use that energy, I think is awesome. But I think a lot of people, they just come and they just, they just spew their negative. And that, that's a problem with the teams and the camps too, right? Is yeah. that you should be able to go to somebody that disagrees with your person, you know, that you idolize or follow or whatever, right? And instead of like, you should go there out of curiosity and not go there and be like, Hey, you know, I'm going to now, you know, crap, talk to this other person. Like, look, I'll tell you this. And I'll tell you this on behalf of the majority of the experts in this field. If I want to say something I disagree about with somebody else, then I will say it on my own. You guys don't need to say it on my, on my behalf. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. I, I think, I, I think when it comes to sort of like the camps and the use of social media during, during these last couple of years, which has obviously been hard for everybody. I think you tend to see, you, Things, ch big challenges globally or personally tend to highlight someone's true personality. For every person I've seen that that comes like that, and it, it says a lot about them, there's another person that uses social media uh, that's benefited them over the time of, of lockdown. Like, I started this podcast during this pandemic. I, mm -hmm. I have reached out and made connections with people that 
you know, that, you know, people that I've, I've known for a few years, you know, to some, to some extent like yourself and like reached out and connected with more. I've made new friends on social media. I've never met in person in my whole entire life. Um, and I think it, you can really make something of the social media thing to really benefit your career. But so many people, it's, it's something inside them. I, you know, I, I, I always talk about going to this event called the Waking Up Weekend, which is a phenomenal event. It's one of the early things that set Tony Robbins up for what he did. Um, and they had this lunchtime drill where at lunchtime you had to go, you had two minutes to go up to someone you didn't want to have lunch with and say, I want to have lunch with you. And at lunch, you had to tell them why you didn't want to have lunch with them. And I remember like sitting there going, oh, I won't get that many. I had, it was me and this one guy that sat smoking weed on the brakes thinking aliens were coming to abduct him. And me were the two most popular people. And I was like, what did I do? And you look at it and you speak to these people and you realise that, you know, I was relatively in shape in the time, so I was prepping for a shoot. I was, I'm loud by nature. I appear more confident maybe than I am. And it shows you how people's judgments of you is often a reflection of what's going inward, nothing about what you're doing outward. And, and social media, I suppose, that's, that's multiplied by the fact that they can sort of hide in the shadows. And, you know, as you said, it becomes these almost bots kind of people. Yeah, I, th- I think, you know... You just have to, you, we just have to accept that, you know, the social media and the internet has made a lot of things easier for us. Like it's easier to reach out to somebody. It's easy to, to communicate to a large group of people or whatnot, right? But anytime we knock down barriers that expand our ability to be do, to do something that often comes with then an increased responsibility, right? And I think that's a big thing is, is that like, okay, people now speak as if there's no consequences for how they interact with somebody, but they would never interact that way in person Mm. right like you like no i mean there's no gym in the world where you know people walk up to other people in the gym and talk like they do in social media comments right that and and and, and so and i mean i I dabble in a little psychology stuff or whatever because it interests me you know like you know whatnot i've never been like a person with big social skills so the more i can nerd out about it like you know in terms of like analyze it the better um but that whole idea of anonymity and the way that impacts people from a psychological standpoint right what that re- that really tells you a lot about who those people are so it's like how do they act you know it's like that whole like you know how would how, how would you act when nobody's looking you know mm-hmm. you know would you still work hard or whatever right and it's so it's so the people that you know would behave poorly if they knew they could get away with it, like that's essentially what, you know, social media just creates such an environment for, for that to flourish. And unfortunately, you know, with algorithms and all that other stuff, right. Like we got to the point, I think, and maybe things are changing a little bit where it's like that type of content, like, like flourishes, right. Like Hmm. people are more attracted to things that produce fear or offense or, or whatnot, you know, and they're drawn to that. So they're like, if I post something controversial, people are way more likely to engage with that. Like I will get more comments and like all, like way more engagement mm. than if I post something that is very educational, very thought out, very, what I would consider like extremely valuable content. Like you should have paid for this. Yeah. I will get much less engagement than if I post something super simple but it's a little controversial, right? Yeah. And especially if that controversy can be linked to another person. Right? 100%. And, and it's not it's not an accident that people, you know, start going towards that because, you know, they realize like I can actually grow my following and my engagement and I can actually get the people that follow me to be like almost like a little army of me or whatever by continuing to feed them this stuff, Yeah. right? So who knows, maybe that's why Instagram doesn't give me much engagement, you know, because I, I don't produce enough of that content. Um, yeah, but it's, it's really interesting. You talk about the you know, people, why people respond when no one's looking. Like, are you familiar with Devin Brown, the magician? The mentalist magician. So he's a- uh, Oh, I, okay. Not by his name, but I know who the mentalist is, yes. Yeah. So he did a show in the UK a while back where he, 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 he had this social experiment where he had these people in the audience and they were watching this guy Ruddy's life and basically had hired all these actors that certain things would happen to them and they would vote what the response was. So like girl walks past, she will either come down and sit down and drink with him or she'll accuse him of um, eyeing her up and they get into an argument. And it, it progressed and progressed and progressed. And he got all the audience to put on these white masks. 
and they progressed and progressed and progressed. They were doing terrible things to this guy. And the social experiment wasn't on him. The social experiment was on the audience. And like, where would they go when they're in a crowd and they're faceless and they can hide behind, you know, not knowing who this guy is? And it was quite mm. shocking of what people would do. And they say social media is a uh, maybe a less extreme, but larger scale version of this sort of thing. You can be whoever you want. I think... I think the platforms where people are more anonymous, you see the worst behavior. Like I think like YouTube and Reddit, like are like you, there's way more trolls on there than there are on Instagram. Cause most people, their Instagram profile is a link back to them. Yes. Right. So, and that, and I think that's why you see like right now I have seen more, we'll say like fake type profiles than I've ever seen. Like I would say probably in the last, you know, six months more, than I've seen the entire rest of the time that we've been doing stuff on social media. Like it's, really it's re yeah, it's like, cause I just, I just, I just scroll through occasionally. Like I see a new follower, it's like whatever. And I just, I just kind of scroll through and I'm just kind of looking at the icons or whatever. And the number of people that are just like no picture and like weird name and numbers or whatever. Yeah. It's like, Hmm. Yeah. So why, why are all of a sudden there's so many of those? I remember seeing like none of those. And now it's like, man, we've got to just start going through and removing these or something. Cause you know, yeah. like it's not good. Not so to finish up and moving into training for the last part of this, you know, early on, you mentioned about you have been doing work with EMG studies and basically testing out your, you know, your confirmation biases, eliminating them, which is in a way a relatively brave thing to do because it is, you've, you know, you've built this brand upon, you know, this, really scientific approach to training and you could have proven that you were completely right in all these things or completely wrong in all these things now was there anything in those emg results that surprised you was there anything that didn't work how you thought it was going to work what were the, the more surprising stuff you found um i mean i wouldn't say i mean so basically the the process we have is like this is, is that we do biomechanical modeling to try and predict you know, what these exercises would be like based off of the mechanics, right? And we've, you know, we've done enough stuff to learn, you know, okay, how is the nervous system going to react in this situation, whatever it was, it's pretty predictive. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, and, and, then, and then we do the EMG testing after that. So the majority of the time, you know, things line up pretty well, but occasionally mm -hmm. when the mechanical modeling, it can be really complex because, you know, it's like, okay, we got multiple joints, you know, here, and there's lots of synergists and stuff. Then it's like, then it's like these subtle differences of like, okay, a little rotation here, whatnot, like, like, um, like the pecs was a big one for us to change. Um, and I kind of like hit my head, like, you know, after we did it, I'm like, I've been doing this with, I've been treating the lats this way forever. Why the hell did it take me so long to, switch over and start using the same logic for the pecs in terms of them mm. going like around the rib cage type motion. Okay. Um, and, you know, and so what really is, is like, all right, you know, the, the, the idea, which I don't know how well people can see me or if they listen to this, but basically if you take your arm in closer to your side and drive your elbow back, right. Mm. And you're trying to figure out, well, how much does that stretch my pec versus if I reach my arm, like, you know, back this way or this way. Right. Mm. And, you know, because it doesn't seem like much, like it seems like, oh, I could stretch my pec, you know, kind of reaching back this way, or I could stretch it reaching this way, or I could, you know, kind of stretch it like, like some people might even feel like that this isn't the one that is more of a stretch than this or that or whatever, because of the fascia and the pec minor underneath uh, that they're feeling, et cetera, whatever. And so that was one where, um, you know, working that one out, took a little bit of time because it's like all right where exactly in there do we need to be and like exactly how do we need to get this position to be the absolute best stretch yeah uh, on the pecs right and then the same thing because it's like as you bring the shoulder across well it's like well how much protraction do we need right like i know we're taking you know origin to insertion here but it's like how much of that protraction and rotation needs to occur and when does it need to occur? Because one of the things that happens when we're trying to work out like, okay, this is the specific place we want to go for the clavicular fibers of the pec, right? Is, is that if you just blindly try and go there, if you have your arm a little too in, out, a little too rotated or whatever, you won't get to that spot, right? Like, so that that is something that, you know, has t was taken a little bit of time to work out all of those variables, right? Mm. Um, is that exercise dependent? Is that exercise, like, a more like, load dependent than exercise dependent as well, right? Because I suppose like putting aside line of force and resistant profiles and all that will obviously change things. 
Like one of your big things with regards to the pecs was obviously not keeping your shoulder blades depressed too much and locked in place when you're yeah. doing pressing exercises. Mm-hmm. Would that change from certain, like obviously if you're getting to a bench press or whatever dumbbell press where it gets very, very heavy, is there going to be more of an argument of keeping them more locked in from a safety and stability standpoint and then allowing them to move on these flies, which would change a little bit of how you look at this in terms of the program? If that makes sense. So, so the glenohumeral rhythm changes a little bit with loading, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but very small, very small. Okay. So you, you look at, and I did a video of, uh, I think the guy's name is Kirill or whatever. It was like, a, it was a, it was a record setting bench press, right? And he protracts during the bench press, right? <laughs> and he protracts pretty much the same amount that he should protract during his lighter set of the bench press. And I think that's, that's mm-hmm. something that gets lost on people is just that like, it's thinking like, oh, well, because it's here and I'm gonna be doing it now, it really just comes as like, well, what is the end destination of that? Like, cause his hands are out wide or whatever, right? So it's just, he's not coming around as much. So there's going to be relatively less of the protraction, but you're not gonna have a more stable shoulder if you come across more, but you're, you're back more, mm. right? It's about being in the right position of both joints relative to each other and relative to the load. So there'd be a difference between doing a fly where the load would be pushing straight out with like a cable versus having some load that was pressing sagittally back into you, right? And so your scapula is trying to figure out, hey, what is the, what is the most stable place for me to be? Which is why our solution is like, look, if you focus on exactly what you need to do with the humerus, your nervous system is unconsciously going to regulate that scapula better than you can consciously decide, right? Like if you're, if you, if you restrict you excessively, pro, you, if you do anything where you're like consciously manipulating the scapula, you are deciding that, you know, better than all of the years of evolution and all of the years of adaptation, since you've been alive, how to organize those two joints together. So you better be damn sure that you're doing it better than your nervous system. And it's always never the case. It's almost always the case that if you teach people how to move the humerus properly, that the scapular rhythm will get better just mm. by actually doing that. It's just that we tend to train, like there just seems to be this huge gap between like very nuanced training that's like very biomechanically proficient. Um, and then people that are just like, oh, like none of that stuff matters or like this exercise does this or whatever, right? And in reality, it's like the, like we can be very nuanced with biomechanics, but we can also understand that like, Hey, if you just go under a load, your body's just going to do this thing that it does. And we can look at what happens and then we can say, well, is that good? Is that bad or, or whatever? Right. It's not just like, just be thoughtless about it because you don't have control over it. It's like, no, be thoughtful about it because you can still make a programming decision on it without having to be like, Oh, you know, I'm not going to put 16 cues in this for a client, but I know if I put them in this environment, this is the, this is the likely outcome rather than just thinking like, Oh, it just doesn't matter. Just choose any chest exercise or, or whatever. There's, there's this, there's a huge gap right now between like the people that really understand biomechanics and a lot of people that understand a little bit. And I, I don't know how this is going to go, but right now I would say like, I'm to the point where I'm thinking about removing the word biomechanics from our course because it's just the the amount of stuff out there that's just being taught at an embarrassing level. And I think that's just a lot of people just like, they learn a little bit and they jump in too soon. Um, And I would say I'm absolutely guilty of making the majority of those mistakes also earlier in my career. Um, And it wasn't until we really kind of started moving away from the foundational information and actually looking back like okay we need to go back we need to learn anatomy better because all even though like i took you know cadaver lab in university or whatever it's like that really wasn't as nuanced as i need it to be to be talking about exercise to this level right um and i think that's where you know some of the other people in your circle or whatever that you know maybe we've taken a different approach is like we've went back and we've like okay there's, there's a deeper level to this anatomy stuff. And it's really hard to find resources on it. Like some of like, like, for instance, we're looking at, you know, how some muscles share common origins through connective tissue and whatnot. And it's like, okay, you know, maybe I can find three references on this 
on earth, right? And maybe one of those is like from an original Grey's Anatomy text that's like, you know, it's decades old, right? And it's like, so maybe I get like this like black and white drawing sketch or whatever. And it's like, okay, so I have to take that and then somehow bring it to, you know, 2021 level. But those things, those things have a massive impact, right? Like, like I, you know, the, the, the one that springs to mind there is, is the psoas having a pastoral attachment to the diaphragm, which will then, yeah. then ch completely change where, okay, how does my breathing mechanics affect my hip and vice versa? But you wouldn't make that, if you looked at just a basic anatomy textbook of origins and insertions, you wouldn't link the two. But yeah. when you start to say, take that nuance, you go, oh, okay, my ribcage position has a massive impact on the stability of my hip and vice versa. Um, and I, I think that's, you're right in the sense of the biomechanics. Like I, I struggle to use that word now for that exact reason. It's like, where's that line between what is sort of like optimal and practical in it? Like I remember when I first started, you know, I'm not a naturally built squatter. I've got big long femurs, short tip fib. And if I'm looking to build my quads, Back squat's never going to be my, my, my preferred exercise of choice. But when I first started getting looked at from people who had RTS, and this is not a knock on Tom Purvis or Mark Goulden or anyone else, these guys can apply it well, but it's the people that are a few rungs down learning from him were like, you're not built to it, don't do it, do pendulum squat instead, which is fine. But at what point then do you go, well, he's never practicing the skill of the squat. Is there a way of progressing him to some form of squatting pattern, whether that's massively heels elevated, much wider stance, whatever else. And what I found over years is like, yeah, I've got good quads. My, I moved considerably worse. And it's, it's, to some extent, if that's entirely what I wanted and just wanted to be as jacked as possible, I don't care if I can sit down in the toilet without shifting shapes, then fine. But most clients you're going to get are going to be somewhere in the middle. They're going to, you know, they can do 12 weeks of truly hypertrophy, but eventually kind of want something more to the training. And that's what keeps their enjoyment. So when it comes to like you looking at the, the application of, of mechanics, like where's that line that you draw between working around structural issues and looking to improve on what can be improved? Um, Big question, I, mean, I know. Yeah. All right. So yeah, condense that into, you know, less than five hours. Right. Uh, <laughs> I would say, you know, what we're looking at because, because the way we approach things from the stimulus perspective is that tends to work a lot of that out because I might choose a different exercise, you know, during a neuro phase versus a hypertrophy phase versus a metabolic phase. So I would say if I had to summarize what we do, it's really, we just look like, it. it's like, what's the best option we have for that, the particular goals, right? Um, and then just go for that. But then we change the goal. We move the goals more often than most people do, which means then there will be time that we're able to bring in those other exercises, or whatever, because there will be phases where it's like, look, I don't need to hit the absolute length and position of the quads this time. So this is a good time to use a different exercise, you know, for that or whatever. Or it's like, actually, you know, I need, this is a systemic place. Like, cool. You know? Yeah, sure. Maybe you couldn't get quads, you know, in uh, a squat, like a pendulum squat, but I bet if we put you in some sort of squat pattern, you can get a much better systemic output than you could in just the pendulum squat, right? Okay. So especially if we talk about the ratio of systemic demand to muscular fatigue, which is what we're trying to achieve there, right? In order for you to get systemic demand in a pendulum squat, you basically have to murder your quads, right? But I might be able to put you in a heel elevated trap bar or a squat or whatever and be like, okay, cool. So now we can do this. It'll be systemically demanding, but you know your quads won't be shot. So that means we can do it again in two days or three days or whatever, which is exactly what we're going for. But if I murder somebody on a very, quad bias like perfectly designed machine well maybe we're not hitting that again for you know five six days yeah and is that how you come about going into progression and exercise as well because the more i i you know learn in this industry i don't really like the term progression regression because i just find exercises they're different they're not a progression they're not yeah. regression they're different for the stimulus involved yeah. so is that a similar thing where your your exercise selection evolves with the stimulus that's evolves rather than looking at let's say front elevated flat rear elevated split squat where like I, that's the one that always got i got i couldn't get my head around because everyone's got but you do front elevated first charles is a very firm believer in that i'm like mm -hmm. but no because in one ex one example that could be more hip flexion, a greater range of motion and more challenge. And for someone else, depending on how high the foot is, it's a regression. It's not, it's different. 
Um, no. So we is it the look, same thing? No, we don't use a progression regression model. We look at how closely does this exercise achieve the goal we want, right? And that's looking at, okay, what's range of motion does it we take it in, right? How specific is it to the, like the target tissue? Is it very specific? Is it kind of specific, right? How much of that range of motion, where in the range of motion, where, what's the resistance curve, you know, profile of that, you know? Um, and we do, I would say the closest thing would be is, is that like, is there a skill component to that lift? Yes. Like that affects the loadability for that client, right? So it's just like, okay, this exercise here, because it requires this degree of technique means we can't use it for these stimuluses right now because we can't train it to that degree of muscular fatigue, right? Like technique will give out or a stabilizer or some other muscle or whatever will give out or, or, or whatnot. Or this, it'll just be too much of a technical challenge for the goal, right? And, but I still wouldn't consider that as progressions and re regressions of the exercise. It's just, that's actually on the client's aspect of like, hey, you know, this is where you are. These are the exercises that just happen to fit you right now that you're most capable of, right? But it's like, that doesn't mean that when you switch to the other version, that that makes that other version necessarily better. It might be no better. It's just like, okay, now you could, you could, you could get that stimulus in a more complex way, but we might be able to do, get the same or better stimulus in an exercise that's just simple. So really it comes down to a logistical decision of like, hey, you know, if I don't have a lot of options and I have to choose between giving you something simpler that's not quite as good versus some, giving you something complex that's a little bit better, then I have to make that judgment call for the client at that time. Right. Yeah. But if I have all the exercise options in the world and I have the best machines and everything, there's pretty much nothing that I can't do with a client that I can simplify enough for them to, you know, achieve the stimulus that day. Right. Really, yeah. it comes down to working with whatever limitations they have. Yeah. And, 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 and knowing and again, come back to knowing your anatomy, learning your setup. I think that, that there's one thing that I knew already, but I certainly took away from you the, the in person course that we did. It's like, how much easier coaching becomes when setup is nailed down. If you can get someone set up, yeah. like you can coach. I find it very rare now that I struggle to coach someone on anything. And all I've done is got better at my setup of exercises where it's easier to do it right than do it wrong. Yeah. yeah. I, that, that was, I think probably the, the biggest improvement both for us and all of our students as well, because you know, if you followed us back in the MI40 days, we used to shitload of cues, right? Like we were, we were trying to problem solve with cues and, and then it hit me. It's, it's like, this is not the right way to go about it. Right. Is because I would, because there would be people that just get it and they weren't intellectually smarter, you know, like, and it's like, and that, that's what allowed them to do a, a row better. It's just like, whatever it's like, oh, it fit them better, but like, okay, what does fit them better? Oh, that means that their body was positioned better for this. So why don't we just position everybody's body in the best way possible? And then maybe they don't have to, you know, have this, you know, yeah. mental gymnastics that they're going through to try and get the exercise right. And I know a lot of trainers love cues, like to the point where they just keep saying them, even when the clients don't need them. And that drives me nuts more than anything, <laughs> right? Like, it's just like, I, I, like at any time I see that at a course or whatever, I'll be like, Hey, if they don't need the cue, don't say the cue. Cause the, the only thing you can do at this point, because if they're already doing it, the only thing that providing that instruction can do is possibly make it worse. Yeah, doubling up, the head only up. possible outcome. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I see um, that, that, that you... and over cueing that, and over, that over cueing and over, over spotting are the two things. Like I, 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 I hate it when someone's literally holding onto someone's wrist or their elbows to a whole set of dumbbell press. I'm just like, let them do it. Just step back for yeah. a second. You'll know before they fall to bits when to step back in. Allow them to learn the pattern without you being over their shoulder all the time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think, I think that's, you know, if there's one thing that people take away, you know, from our introductory stuff is, is this, yes, like just switch all of your mental effort into setting up your clients right, right? Mm. I mean, it, the sessions, are, I mean, there's just so much more enjoyable, right, to like for on both parties, right? Because one of the things that I try and tell people is like, look, when you're when you're constantly giving your client instruction, you don't know what the psychological impact of that is going to be all the time. Right. Because like imagine that you were doing something and there was just somebody walking around barking at you, telling you how to do it. Right. Like a, a literal like, you know, backseat driver for your life. Right. Like that would make you feel really crappy. And eventually you just want to just like kick that person out. Yeah. Um, and so in the gym, it's no different. It's like your client wants to feel like they're doing a good job. And that's a lot more of a challenge if 
you, you're just saying the same things to them all the time. They don't know if they're doing any better or any worse or whatnot. And the fact that you're constantly having to instruct them keeps them in the state of always thinking that, man, I can't do this right without you like constantly, you know, ragging and telling me, you know, how to do it or, or whatnot. Right. And, but it's like, Hey, if you get people set up, right. And then they just do it on their own. And then the only thing you have to do is provide encouragement and effort and maybe tighten up the technique as fatigue comes that's a lot more gratifying experience on the client's end, right? They yeah. will they will walk out of that session feeling much better about themselves, right? Yeah. They, I think, I think with trainers sometimes it's like they might feel like the way they need to deliver value is that they need to be overly involved in the experience and like no, you 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 set the client up for a successful session, right? And then, and then you guide them through that, right? But your, your goal is not to take the workout over for them. Otherwise, I mean, just grab the dumbbells yourself and do the reps, man. Yeah. Like, <laughs> couldn't, 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 agree, couldn't agree more. So like, just to sort of like task, I know I've taken up a lot of your time and this is your evening for your chance to wind out and not be always on. Um, so before we go into where to find you, recently you launched the biometric coaching course, which is the, the newer offering from your um, on your site. Tell us a little bit about that, why that came about, and uh, who was it for? Um, so actually, that's the first third-party coach or educator that we have on there. That's Dustin Nelson, um, who is a longtime friend um, and mentor that I've learned from. Uh, as well from way back in the Polyquin days and whatnot. And Dustin has a tremendous background um, in traditional Chinese medicine and, you know, basically that, that whole Eastern medicine field. Um, and he spent the last, like, I don't know how many years, basically trying to figure out how to translate that, you know, for all of us, you know, pale Western people right, <laughs> that have, a, have had a totally different approach. Um, and one, one of the things that I always liked about that, right, because, um, you know, reading a little bit into the Chinese medicine stuff when I was younger is, is it's very practical stuff, right? And so it's not necessarily you trying to become a doctor per se, but it's like, hey, these are things as a coach, as a trainer, that you could assess and evaluate and provide an intervention with, and then have an, be able to subsequently reevaluate that. Um, and they tend to be very low risk, right? You know, type interventions or whatnot. Um, and so the, the whole purpose of the biometric course was is like, can we add, you know, in, in, can we add things that are in the wheelhouse of a coach that could improve their ability to figure out, well, what stimulus does this person need? How well are they recovering? When do they need to? you know, switch training phases, right? Like, and, you know, are there other metrics that I can use, you know, like the ability to add something in as simple as looking at somebody's tongue, right? It's like, okay, what, you know, and trying to, you know, trying to say like, okay, can we learn a little bit about how somebody is experiencing stress and inflammation and whatnot, you know, from something as simple as like, okay, looking at a tongue, right? That's no different than, you know, looking at the, somebody's squat form or whatever. And you're like, okay, it looks like you're doing this. Let's move your feet this way and see what happens. Right. And it's like, this is almost like, I look at this as almost a tool set where it's like, okay, it looks like this. Let's try this, you know, lifestyle intervention, or let's try this supplement, or let's try this change in your nutrition or your training um, and see what happens and see if that doesn't add, we'll say more tangible data to the assessment that are within the tools of a coach, right? So it gives us a little, you know, it gives us better ways of thinking about things like HRV and stuff like that. So really that course um, is meant to add nuances to your, your ability to assess clients as a coach without having to try and play doctor. That's, that's yeah. exactly where that fits in, right? Um, so it's like, you know, and, and again, then the interventions also are in that play of like, look, these are things that aren't going to be super objectionable to your client, right? To be able to, to, to try out. Um, I think that's the best way that I could describe that, um, you know, without uh, doing any injustice to like the complexity of it. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. I think, I think, I, and again, it's coming, it comes back down to what is the lowest barrier for entry for a client to be able to actually take some of this stuff and make it work. And I think that's a fascinating approach. Certainly immersing myself in, this that part of the world you know there's so much stuff here in the medicine realm that i i don't understand or i haven't explored and i think that, i think it's a, it's a fascinating realm of 
how much of the modern westernized medicine that we have now has come albeit far too late from from this part of the world and i think there's there's just there's so much that could be uncovered here i think it's very interesting yeah and it, J- dustin does a very good job of providing as much translation in there because like you know people look at things like oh what is spleen chi and like you know, they're just like what the hell is that um because it's like like the way that you know they will talk about things in chinese medicine is very different and that it's more of a we'll say like because like when they say kidney they don't literally mean kidney mm. right and when they say spleen they don't literally mean spleen um like we do um, it's just like the, these are the, these are translations to us, but they refer to more systems than they do organs, right? Um, you know, so like if if somebody has like you know, so kidneys is going to be like a combination of like cellular cellular energy production and adrenal health, and like it's that whole it's that whole system. It's not your literal kidney. So it's this it's this more like big picture scope view. Um, which I like. And uh, then the ability to translate that into like, well, the herbs that they used back then, these are the things that we have that work mechanistically similar to those herbs, right? Because it's mm-hmm. like, oh, they, they use this, right? But what we know now is that increases glutathione, you know, or whatever it may be. And it's like, oh, okay. So it makes for, I mean, I know like a ton of people in the evidence-based community that like anything, anytime it comes to anything Eastern medicine related, whether it be herbology, whether it be, you know, acupuncture or whatever, like they'll just be like, oh, boo that, you know, and be like, oh, there's no research on that. And there's actually like, you know, thousands and thousands of studies on it, ironically, right? But it's like, no, there's just nothing that you're reading now or whatever. But also yeah. there's, you know, that's not one of those things where it's just like, yeah, you know, you do this thing and it turns you into Superman. Like, no, but if you take that stuff into context, like I have used this stuff as a coach extremely successfully throughout my career but i'm in no position to teach it yeah and so that's where we're really fortunate to have dustin come on and do it Mm. right because i i mean i i learned enough that i was able to utilize some of those tools very successfully in my coaching career right you know and like things where it's like okay the stuff off the shelf would not work but you know i got you know a little formula here, whatever, or, you know, I added this thing to my assessment and it's like, oh, that works. I got, I got another thing instead of like, oh, Hey, here, just take the adrenal supplement from whatever bodybuilding company that has literally every herb that any herb that on examine.com says does something for adrenal, <laughs> you just put that in there, and just take it. Right. You know, just like, cause that's, that's what the majority of the supplement industry is. Right. This is like, okay. You know, it's like, these are all things that, are associated with that we just put it all in a we just build the ingredient list up as big as possible right and that's kind of the opposite of what they were doing in chinese medicine which is like how do we get the right herbs in the right combination that seem to have a benefit and now that we can kind of translate that a little bit more you can even even if you don't use like any of those formulas you understand what you would actually be looking for in either single or traditional single yeah. ingredients or traditional supplements right I think that's something that also is it was it's just almost been lost in the after the death of Charles Pollock in the sense of his biosync. And you know, a lot of people will go, it's a lot of a lot of people just selling a lot of supplements and you know, a lot of these things are just mm-hmm. sorted out by training and diet alone. And while that to a degree may be very much true, I witnessed the era where people were literally living and breathing that sort of stuff. And I saw people use higher doses of certain things, have tremendous results in certain areas on whether it's just on the sites they use or clients' health or recovery. And I think like everything, like, I think I say this phrase in every podcast, but like the answer falls somewhere in the middle. Like, do, do, does, do you need a supplement list as long as you are on day one because your umbilical readings are for 20? Of course not. But it doesn't mean that some of the things that were taught in there are incredibly useful if you know the right dosages and the right person to use it with. Absolutely. And especially when it comes to things like stress and recovery and things like HRV, there's, there's, there's massive scope to improve someone's recovery with the right things. Yeah, I think probably what was lost in that and, and, and this is this is a big thing if like, if you're listening to this, and you're somebody that really likes the, you know, or really falls on the, you know, on the side of, you know, being very evidence based, which I don't even like that term evidence based, because it t- seems to be just like, specific research bias based is what it really is. It's yeah. not all because it's not, it's not all evidence, um, which is what you actually need to look at. But is is that when we look at research and when we look at stuff that's being done in a controlled environment versus what is being done in you know 
actual practice and people that have flexibility in their lives where it's just like, they're not in the metabolic ward or, you know, they're, they're going to go off their diet or whatever, like the way they feel and experience the diet and the training matters. That's where I think a lot of things that kind of got poo-pooed on in terms of like, well, if this person, if this person acts is like stuck to this rigid lifestyle and this diet and this training, they have no choice because it's in a research setting. They have to go through with it. They can get just as good a result as the person that doesn't do it. That's one thing. But then understanding like, Hey, if you give people a few things that make them make the experience better, whether that's, they feel like they perform better, the, you know, they sleep, like just like all of these like small intangible compounding variables where it's like, Hey, I know there's plenty of instances where it's like, look, this doesn't boost their metabolism. It's not a fat burner, you know, whatever, but it's like, I know that these things here are going to enhance their experience and actually make it easier for them to comply and achieve the calorie deficit and the workouts and whatever. So it's like, those are the things that you lose if you're being overly strict on how you're evaluating the data and then just applying that as if every person can function in that same context when it's reality. It's like, look, there's a lot of things that we have to do in the real world to be successful that you, that won't show up on a lab because the lab removes those conditions. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 exactly. And it comes back to that thing of nuance as well. Right? A lot of people that, that are appeal to the evidence-based camp, it's, it's almost, like they don't understand the deeper side of working of it. So they'd rather fall on the level of simplicity. Now, while most clients might fall on the basics, a few simple things that are what the evidence-based people will get 90% of your results, but it doesn't mean that that 10% isn't important for the right person. And it's, it just takes a lot more work and a lot more understanding to be able to know what is useful, what is not, and what is not useful for your clientele, like you said earlier. So yeah, it's going much, in, go on. It's much easier to dismiss an idea than to take on the effort to understand it. But yeah, exactly. So the um, so for people who want to learn more about you, who want to learn more about N1 and training, before I ask a couple of more silly closing questions, um, where can people find you and your courses and everything else like that? So our courses are on n1.education, um, but if you want to just kind of see what we're about, there is a preview course on there that you can do that you, you know, I can't remember how many, it's like six hours worth of content or whatever mm -hmm. that you could just, you know, look at for free. Um, but we're on YouTube, you know, just put in n1 education. Uh, we're on Instagram. We have three accounts on there. My coach Kasim uh, account, n1 education, n1 training. Uh, and then hopefully we will be launching an app here in January of 2022, which will kind of be taking everything uh, and putting it in, in one spot. But, you know, we appreciate support wherever, whenever you guys want to provide it. We do probably put out as much, if not more content than almost anybody in terms of like actual education based mm. content. Um, our, our, like if you're looking for, you know, slim clothing and you know big butt cheeks and just like stuff like that you know product placed you know jar of bcaas you know what like yeah you're not going to find any of that on on our stuff but you know if you're just looking at you know very simple exercise comparisons tips and tricks and stuff like that you know highlights from our courses then you'll find tons of that yeah like, like i said i said this at the start of the podcast and i'll say it again i can totally vouch for the the, the amount of content and i, and I appreciate that i was you know, I was a beta tester, so I've seen this develop over the years. But the the amount of content on your courses is unbelievable. Like, you, you really do have, like, it, it's worth going through from, like a book, from page one to page end. But one of the most things I've found with your course, because there's so much content, going back in, and if I'm ever struggling with a program, I can go back into a certain module and go, okay that makes sense there's always something there so if there's a coach watching this i 100 percent vouch for cast's courses they're absolutely phenomenal and the, the what you guys do with the team do is is, is is absolutely like top notch um so going on to a little bit of like a couple of sillier questions just to end off so recently you put up a post um sharing people that you would support in the industry and this listed and then when you swiped there was like the you know the you you mentioned like the, the list of people that you wouldn't plus um, the people that if they, you, know, you wouldn't invite, you know, wouldn't go out with for pizza. And I just remember I had this flashback of your R Practical course 
Well, I, I literally did just that. And I asked you, do you want to go for pizza? <laughs> um, so I kind of just wanted a silly question of what is your favorite fast food restaurant? If pizza isn't your thing, what is your thing? Okay. Well, one, that, that wasn't exactly the post, but I'll answer the question anyway. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, I've never been a big like fast food person. I would say right now, the thing that I do probably go to more in that realm um, would be wings. We have a franchise here in the States. It's called Buffalo Wild Wings. It's not the best, but it's, you know, in terms of fast food, uh, it's pretty decent, but I actually, I actually do like pizza quite a bit. So the, okay. the second part of that post was actually like, was like, here's the list of people that I agree with a hundred percent and yeah. there's no, nobody listed. And at the bottom it said, and anybody that suggests we get yeah. pizza. So basically I will agree with anybody that suggests we get pizza. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess, I guess, I guess, except you, I guess that was maybe. <laughs> so um, yeah, so yeah. just so that was at a time where on, Nick was uh, like, I, we were going through uh, all of those gyms or whatever, and that super huge heat wave was coming through, and yeah. our Airbnb had no AC or whatever. So it's like, at that that might have been one of the very few times the world's like, no, it's like I've been sweating for sixteen hours. I don't want pizza <laughs> right now. Like, yeah, give, it was, it's a hot give gym me a cold well. bath and a sushi. Yes, yeah, <laughs> a hot hot old basement. So just to close off, what is it? Um, that you are most grateful for at this moment of time. It can be a couple of things. Um, well, since we've just opened the HQ, um, I would say <clears throat> one of the things I'm most grateful for is <laughs> the ability to have been involved in the development of equipment. Um, because, I mean, my gym is full of things that I have at least in part designed and innovated myself. Mm. Um, and, you know, when I, when I, when I first embarked on this journey, I was like, Oh yeah, I'm going to get the best equipment. But now it's like, that was just the best equipment that was available. Right. And you, you quickly learn that even with the best things that could always be, could always be better. And now it's like, I have so many things where it's like, this is exactly ex like, or as close to exactly yeah. as I would mm. want it as possible. Um, I, my only thing I wish to spend, it's like, I wish I would have had this 10 years ago when I was really like training, like for physique goals, where it's like, now I have it where I'm training to not be so fat, uh, like, <laughs> you know, and for mostly research, but, um, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so that, that's, that's something I'm hugely grateful for. Uh, and I would say the other thing is, is just, I mean, really just the amount of, uh, support and feedback that we've gotten from our students. Um, cause I mean, that's, that is the why for why, like I have the intellectual interest that I could delete all of my stuff, you know, close the business and I would go in a cabin and I would still nerd out on these things by myself and be fulfilled by that. Like, you know, yeah. like, just, just like, yep, yeah, I just want to do this. This is like, I just enjoy playing with this stuff or whatever. What really drives me to want to do any of this stuff from the business is, the the feedback and the experiences that we hear from our coaches like i i mean you know a lot of our coaches now and mm -hmm. over the last few years the number of coaches that we've had that are getting so successful like and so much earlier in their careers like having mm -hmm. this knowledge earlier um that's something where it's just like you know in terms of leaving a legacy or, or making a difference, like that is the best evidence that we have, right? I mean, I, we have more coaches that are training higher profile figures right now than I did in my career, like yeah. as a whole, like, like, and it's, it's pretty crazy. It's, it's pretty crazy to see. And the feedback that we get and the degree of change that it's making in people's careers and lives is like that, 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 that's, it's huge. Like, I started, I started this selfishly because I enjoy it. And then all of a sudden now it's like, now I want to keep, I want to keep investing in this other part because now I have this other reason to really want to do that. Right. And that's not me claiming to somehow be the only altruist in the world or whatever, because obviously I enjoy it. Like that makes me feel good about myself or whatever. Yeah. Right. So, cause people be like, Oh, so you think you're just being altruistic? It's like, no, I completely understand that. I like these other people being successful makes me happy. And that's why I want them to be successful. Yeah. But you know, that's, that's, like that's, 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 that's such, that's such a good answer. And I think it's, it's, it's those things of like, you know, when you look back, 
it's it's like imagine I can imagine what it's like being a proud parent of like seeing your child do things that you couldn't do or you didn't have the ability to do. It's the same thing now. You've got a whole load of coaches that are now successful, you know, massively successful. Mm-hmm. And on on the equipment side of things, it's, it's probably the fitness industry equivalent of having your own action figure. Is being able to have a hat yeah. that you could literally say, "I made that better," and I, I I think that's absolutely fascinating. And Whenever Hong Kong opens up, which is probably sometime in the next decade, we're allowed to actually travel anywhere without quarantine. I'll definitely have to come and see this HQ because congratulations, it looks unbelievable. So awesome. Thank you. We'll be glad to have you. And we will get pizza. Yes. All right, deal. I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going to hold you to that. Right, man, thank you so much um, for today. It's been a really, really, really good chat. Thank you very much for coming on. All right. Thank you, Simon.